We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Tom Luongo. He's the producer of the Gold, Goats, and Guns newsletter and blog, and also the podcast, editor at Newsmax, the ultimate wealth report and contributor to the financial intelligence report. How are you today, Tom? It's great to have you. Uh, it's great to see you, Tom. It's been a while. I'm, uh, I'm glad we were able to find the time. Absolutely. And I appreciate you you making the time for me in your in your busy week here. But why don't we start off with something that's obviously on the top of everyone's mind and something that I think is really important to understand your take on because you look at things from such a, a larger you know, zoomed out view of how all of these, these issues are interconnected and especially overseas. So, you know, obviously what's on everyone's mind is the banking crisis that had developed over this past weekend, um, kind of how the Fed and Treasury acted to backstop this bank run. And maybe we can start by, you know, highlighting any of the important mechanisms here. Sure. Oh, let's start with the, let's start with the beginning at the beginning of this. Um, there are a lot of people out there today with a lot of bad takes about what's what's been going on. There's a lot of people even in the kind of Austro-Libertarian camp about what's happened um, and what, what's going on. And I was just remarking for my patrons, I just did my Wednesday market report for them. And I said, you know, sometimes I feel like the, the ghost of Gary North running around, Dr. Gary North running around going, by the way, you know, did, did y'all forget what stopped the Great Depression in its tracks? It was the creation of FDIC in the first place. The, the way you stop cascading bank runs is by making sure that depositors know that their money is safe. Mm-hmm. Now, that comes with consequences. It comes with moral hazard. It comes with all sorts of things, right? I'm not a fan of FDIC in that respect, but it's the world we live in, yeah. right? So to all of my Austro-Libertarian brethren who are still complaining about the moral hazard of FDIC, I'm like, well, that's nice, but you know, I don't really care how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And I don't care, you know, about the, about your desire to go back to hundred percent reserve banking. I agree that we should go there, but I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon. So please stop arguing about the world we don't have. Mm-hmm. Stop arguing your head and start arguing what's actually happening in front of you. And then think about the order of operations by which to get to the things that you want to see, the world you want to see. And then remember that you're, Hey, That all of our mentors, like, you know, our mentor for all of us, Murray Rothbard, was still voted. He still believed in you do what's best in the moment to move the ball in the right direction. So if you take the big picture here, the big picture is that we have a central bank dominated world. We have a central bank dominated world that was architected by globalists with the idea of doing away with commercial banking. This is the big story. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that everybody needs to wrap their head around. Now, in that scenario, as you and I have discussed many times, and I've discussed on innumerable podcasts and and innumerable articles, when you start to go to war with that system, right, you have to ask yourself, well, who are your allies in this? Who also doesn't want the end of commercial banking? Well, clearly, the Federal Reserve, which is the at, which is the advocate at the end of the day for the U.S. commercial banking system, which is the biggest, most powerful political and financial lobby in the world. They're not, they're not going to be happy with their ox being bored. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can be as, you know, I can, I, I can be as colorful as I want about this right now and say, look, you know, just imagine you're Jamie Dimon and you're like, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not handing this over to Klaus and company over in Europe. It's just not doing it. I'm not handing it over to George Soros. I'm not, you know, whether these people are vultures, whether they are terrible people on any kind of moral, you know, absolute moral scale is irrelevant in all of this. Just like fractional reserve banking is immoral, but it doesn't matter. It's the world we have. Would you rather have a fractional reserve, go return to a fractional reserve commercial banking system where we actually can value, where there's some risk valuation in the market, where we, where there's some people out there who are managing money who you know, aren't believing the lie that R star equals zero, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about. 
So if you're there, if you can at least accept that, then you can start to build an argument as to what's going on. Mm -hmm. I believe Jerome Powell is firmly convinced that Jerome Powell is that guy that wants to move the ball backward. That wants to undo the damage of the last 15 years going back to four Lehman Brothers. I listening to Dan Martino Booth's book about this and, and her, listening to interviews with her talking about when Powell was a junior member of the FOMC board and Bernanke just kind of walked in one day and said, oh, our, our policy now is that we are targeting 2% inflation. And Powell was like, uh, show me in the charter where you have the right to do that. And no one questioned Bernanke except for Powell. Mm -hmm. So Powell's already be, always been here philosophically. He's always been that guy. And so should we be surprised when he gets the opportunity and the Fed is under existential threat to its own existence that he wouldn't, you know, take the, you know, do the thing. Of course he would do what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. And again, I will defer to Danielle on this. Who's made this point many times. Powell's worth a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to sign up for a second term as Fed, Fed chair. He didn't have to do this, but he did. So now ask yourself why. Yeah, it's kind of a, a crazy idea that that anybody would want that job at this point unless they mm -hmm. had some type of motive to to really, let's say, move move that ball in a direction that they really wanted. But on that point that you just made about that 2% target inflation, mm -hmm. what do you think Powell's ideal would be? I think ultimately what Powell wants is a return to a regional banking model where everyday loan origination based on rational risk assessment and market rates are determined by the regional banks to do local lending. It's the, it's the community banking model that the United States was built on. Mm -hmm. Remember, Martin Armstrong makes the point all the time to all the end of fetters out there. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm an end of fetter, but I'm not an end of fetter in 2023. I'm going to end the Fetter when I'm, you know, collecting Medicare. Okay. And I'm not there yet. I'm 10 years away from collecting, nine years away from collecting Medicare. So think of it in, in, in those terms, right? So what does Powell want? He wants a return to that. And Martin Armstrong made the point that, look, the Federal Reserve is originally designed as 12 regional banks to provide localized interest rates and localized liquidity for all of the regional and, and to take care of the banking sector in each of their regions and to provide as needed temporary liquidity in case of, you know, a bank makes a mistake or two banks make a mistake or whatever. Mm -hmm. When And this is where the Austro-Libertarian uh, analysis is correct, but that's been, that's, that's been removed. That's been centralized. It's, again, I'm not here to have a philosophical discussion about, about this. I agree with all of these arguments. What I'm saying is, so we always knew that the Fed was going to wind up being betrayed by FDR, creating a monolithic single thing Fed, Fed funds rate, which would then ad ad advantage certain sectors of certain regions of the United States against others. So California and New York versus Mississippi, mm -hmm. right? The structure of the Fed was designed around kind of in helping to enforce that and to create that. It allowed for rapacious members of the banking system in areas in various areas of the country to attack each other and to take each other out and to consolidate power and then build the system we have today. But then again, once you have that system in place there, then don't you think that someone else can look at that and go, oh, can we can we subvert that again? And then create, as Jeff Snyder's put it, the euro dollar system. Now I happen to disagree completely with Jeff about where we are right now and the power of that euro dollar system because I firmly believe that the Fed has undermined the foundational rate and the foundational impulses of the euro dollar system mm -hmm. because SOFR is at odds with LIBOR. So while I appreciate Jeff's work in explaining to the world why euro dollars, why the euro dollar system has always dominated Fed policy and wagged the tail of the monetary dog, monetary policy dog, I don't believe that that is a situation that is um, inevitable and irreversible. I think it is only possible as long as the Fed is compliant, as long as the Fed's in on the game. Right. So when Greenspan created the, the Greenspan and now the Fed put, 
and Bernanke and Yellen, two egghead uh, ultra Keynesians, and I would argue globalists. And um, you know, Danielle and I disagree about their about their um, about the motives for their shocking naivete. Because I had her on my podcast recently, and we discussed all this. Yeah, and that I, was a great episode that everybody should call. Hey, this thank to. you, I appreciate it. I worked really hard to get to get the right information out of Danielle and to and to and as well to build a good relationship with her because I I think she's fascinating and I think she's fabulous. Um, and um. And so I, I, I think about that. I say, okay, well, I think Yellen is, you know, I think she's in the tank for globalists. I think Bernanke, you know, didn't come up with that policy out of whole cloth. I'm just not, I'm just not buying it, maybe, but I'm just not buying it. I'm also not buying that Bernanke is, you know, standing on the shoulders of Milton Friedman and his, at, and his, and his analysis of the Great Depression. Because the, Austro- because the Austrians' interpretation of what happened is the correct one, right? Friedman was wrong. Gary North was right. The Great Depression would have continued and the bank runs would have continued without the creation of FDIC. Mm-hmm. Nothing they would have been able to do would have worked without the creation of FDIC. So what happens on Sunday? We have Silicon Valley Bank blows up. Ask yourself who blew it up because it's clear that someone blew it up and who's motivated and who would have the incentive to blow it up in the same way that I, uh, that I posited after FTX blew up that the Fed and the New York boys blew up FTX because all crypto stable coins are a just another source of euro dollars. They just happen to not exist offshore in physical banks in you know Switzerland or Hong Kong or Frankfurt or City of London. They exist in cyberspace, but it's the same thing. They're just synthetic claims against dollars with nominal backing by U.S. dollar debt instruments. And in the case of FTX, other magic beans. So Silvergate, F, um, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank were all intimately involved in that si- situation. Mm-hmm. And all last year, when I was trying to figure out, what, or yeah, over the last 18 months, trying to figure out why Bitcoin kept breaking down the way it did with each stable coin that failed, Terra Luna, FTT, blah, blah, blah. Each time you can see that there's a massive takedown in the price of Bitcoin. Why? Because Bitcoin went illiquid. People pulled their money out. You know, the stable coins were destroyed. And, you know, the Ponzi schemes were popped one by one by one by one in, you know, in, in order of vulnerability. You know, the, the crappier their balance sheet, the more vulnerable they were, the, more, the easier it was, the easier it was for them to be taken out. And then F- FTX was rolling them all up and was at the point of, I think, building an escape velocity and an amount, you know, kind of critical mass escape velocity for trust in those systems to challenge the Federal Reserve as the ultimate form of dollar creation and to create a new cyber euro dollar system that the Fed would not be able to. And then eventually the Fed wouldn't be able to fight. So that's why it had to be taken out. That's why it had to be taken out on election night. The timing on that was very important. Right. The, we had the proof, we, we now have proof positive at that point by letting all that stuff come out that the Democrats were laundering money through Ukraine and FTX in order to do all these nefarious things, which then creates a whole, slew behind the scenes of mineral envelopes hitting the table. No, you work for us now. You work for us now. We have you dead the rights. You rigged elections and we know it. We we know you did this. We know you did this. We know you did that. They're not going to go to jail for those things. They're just going to stop doing what they normally do, which is to mm-hmm. continue the process. So again, if you want to get control over monetary policy, fiscal policy, um, you know, just the political structure, the legal structure of the United States, and all these, all these areas where all of that, your all those euro dollars were being brought, were being sent overseas by Congress, levered up twenty to one, hundred to one, and then sent back into conduits like SVB to then be disseminated out to undermine the the institutional competence of the United States. Then clearly, these things need to be taken out mm-hmm. if you're the Federal Reserve. So now, at talk- the same time, they also persecuted Caitlin Long and Custodia Bank. They, they did a lot of other things. Like, I, and I was talking to Caitlin the other day in DM about this, and she's very angry about it, and rightly so. 
<laughs> because she was trying to build a an, a, a Rothbardian style Bitcoin 100% reserve or greater than 100% reserve system, you know, for custodial ownership of Bitcoin. And I didn't have a good answer for it other than to say, you know, why did they do that? Other than timing, other than they're not ready to of uh, validate Bitcoin as part of the financial system yet. Be patient. Maybe, you know, maybe be patient. I'm going to have Caitlin on my podcast in a couple of weeks and she and I are going to hash this out in real time. And I'm going to be happy to, to listen to her counter argument because I may be wrong about this, mm -hmm. but this is the way I see it. So that's what I think happened. I think the Fed took out SVB because they had to. And, you know, the goal here is, is still the same goal as it was before. Destroy all euro dollars. So now you start going first, you take out crypto, the vulnerable cryptos, and then you take out the kind of semi crypto environment, SVB and all the other attendant banks around that. Mm -hmm. And you put the Democrats on notice by getting rid of another for another faucet of their, you know, their liquidity to undermine uh, the, the commercial banking system of the United States. And, you know, the deal he made with Janet Yellen was that, okay, well, the water that you've already spilled on the ground and you've, and you've created for yourself is fine. You get to keep that and we'll even help you keep that, but we get the faucet. And the way I describe, just think of it this way, the Fed turned off the stopcock and then knocked the, knocked the handle off the, uh, off the valve and, and then, you know, sewed the thing with lead. So there's no way of putting it, you know, of opening that back up again. Mm -hmm. And SVB was a $255 billion asset, you know, pump. And again, Danielle, the other day in a great interview she did with Blockworks mentioned that SVB, um, you know, lobbied to not become a CP, right? A, a, an SIFI, a, a systematically important financial institution. Why? Well, she said flat out because they wanted to be able to operate at the edges of the regulation. They wanted to be able to operate as an onshore shadow bank, mm -hmm. which they were. So, Tom, I think one of the, let's say, the big criticisms that I've heard from, from a lot online is that this is a bailout and that it shouldn't happen like this. And, you know, going against capitalism, was it really a bailout? And what are the important points, do you think, to highlight with how this was actually handled between the Fed and the Treasury? I don't think it was a bailout in that respect. I mean, yeah, I mean, some people get bailed. Yeah, they're going to get are their deposits going to get bailed out. Yeah, but they're not going to get anything else. Like the assets are all going to get written down. Yellen lied through her teeth that there were people who didn't want to buy SBB. Martin Armstrong made this point this morning, right? She can lie through her teeth about that. Mm -hmm. She didn't want, they didn't want to sell it to the people who were offering it because then they get to open up and they get to find out what the books really look like. Right. See, again, you know, one of the things you, you got to remember, and this, again, I, I take this stuff from guys like Robert Barnes, who, you know, by the way, disagrees with me about the whole euro dollar argument, um, which is fine. Again, I don't care that these people disagree with me. That doesn't, that doesn't bother me whatsoever. I, I, I expect, I, I want pushback from people. I want people to think deeply about these things and, and error check, because otherwise we're never going to get to anything close to the truth. We're just going to like sit around in a, in a hall of rhetorical mirrors and, and, you know, lobbing grenades at each other. What's the point? No, we have to figure out what's going on here. So, but Robert Barnes always said that, look, these people will always try to avoid going to discovery. So, you know, just thinking about that now, to me, Yellen lying about who, you know, you know, who didn't want to, um, that there were no buyers for SVB. I'm sure there were buyers for SVB. But they want because they wanted to see the books, right? The same way that, you know, the way they decapitated FTX, there was no a, there was no way for them to not get to the books because the books are all public because they're on blockchain. So in this respect, blockchain actually worked to our advantage because now we have a forensic tool to figure out what, what they were actually doing. Mm -hmm. So whereas, you know, with SVB, it's going to be a little harder, but now it's in the hands of the FDIC. And I think that, you know, the first thing that, that struck me as different about this was the fact that the FDIC rolled it up at noon on a Friday. They didn't wait until 530. Mm -hmm. so Remember, they shuttered every bank at 530 on Friday afternoons because they didn't want it to hit the market. They wanted the market to calm down and digest what happened 
and have and let the Treasury and the FDIC and everybody give, an, give 48 hours, 72 hours to respond to this and to massage it, to massage the panic. No, this was actually rolled up in such a way as to create maximal panic. So this is very interesting. So did the Fed blow up FTX through their proxies and through their, you know, through their, their, their fellow travelers? And then did the people who were behind FTX lobby the FDIC to roll the bank up to create as much panic as possible and then start the doom porn cycle all weekend. And oh, by the way, look who fell for it, hook, line, and shrinker. Zero hedge. I hate to throw shade on them, but they've been up my, they've been up my, and they took a pot shot at me the other day. That's okay. I'm okay. They didn't take a pot shot at me directly. They thinly veiled. And I look at Zero Hedge right now, and they're half they're, print, they're printing half of my articles, and they're not printing the other half of my articles. Like it's really obvious that Zero Hedge, knowing what it is, is a, is a company now at war with itself because there are clearly factions within Zero Hedge writing different things on different days and interpreting things different way because everybody has everybody is you know digging their heels in rhetorically and and ideologically about what's going on. And fair, fair enough, everybody is like trying to make sense of this again. You know, look, I'm a big boy. I put my pant, I got my big boy pants on. I can I can live with it. I don't care about you know the slings and arrows. You're gonna if you if you go out on a limb like I do, you have to take the slings and arrows, and you have to be willing to. But you also have to be willing to engage them directly. And again, no you know no shade here. But again, if you think about zero hedge and their their arguments, it's always about fra OIS. It's always about the spread between onshore and offshore dollars. To them, the euro dollar thesis of Jeff Snyder rules. And this morning we had a massive fra OAS blowout by about 50 basis points, which has, we've got bank stocks halted all over Europe, right? We've got the Euro down historically nearly 2% on the day. You think that's going to stop? I can tell you it's only going to get, get started. So. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go, but maybe we can stick with, you know, let's say the, the domestic market. What effect has this had on the bond spreads in the US. Sure. And we can we can start there before we go to the to the, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's so much to unpack here, right? There's so many angles to go on. Exactly. So let's, start with the, let's start with the with the with the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a, a bunch of my patrons, uh, a few of whom are you know regional bankers. Okay. And they were you know pinging me all day and like, you know, and they and they all said the same thing. On Monday morning at eight o'clock, we were all fearing for our lives. By five o'clock, we had seen net capital inflow. Now, that's because of the statement by the deal by Yellen and Powell. Because what Powell did with the bank term funding program, and again, you know, I, I, I cannot understand how people can't see this, you know, that, you know, as Zero had said, buy the friggin' pivot. It's what they said the other day. And I'm like, no, this is by the regional banks. Because on Monday morning, if here's the gig, the standard um, uh, analysis of this would be, oh, look, we blew up the regional banks. This is going to go on for a while. And then all the big banks are going to come in and scoop up all the regional banks at pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. If that were the case, the bank term funding program wouldn't have even been announced yet. We would have had at least two or three or four, probably Friday, they would have announced it. Maybe even Friday after the close, when valuations in the regional banking system were cratered beyond belief and there were massive bank runs. Why? In order to pick these things up at pennies on the dollar, right? Good banks were forced into receivership, which then the, 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 the big banks could then scoop up. No, the big banks don't want their good assets. In 2008, the big banks were doing that because they were in trouble. They needed the good assets on the regional bank's balance sheets in order to shore up their balance sheets, which is why they did what they did then. This time, the big banks are in no danger whatsoever from contagion effect here because they've decoupled from Europe. So they didn't want the regional banks, which is what I've been saying for two years. JP Morgan is not interested in underwriting a loan for a new library in Palatka. Mm -hmm. That's a regional banking problem. They don't want that business. They want the 1500, they want to underwrite the book running on a new big company to build a 2000 mile pipeline from Alaska down into Washington. That's what they want. 
They don't want the library in Palatka. They don't want that on their books. They don't have the, they can't manage that. That's not their business. So as multiple people said to me, we were all fearing for our lives on Monday morning. And by Monday afternoon, they had us dead to rights. All they had to do was, and they didn't. It didn't happen. Powell came out immediately and shored up the free regional banking system and then threw them a bone. Because you think SVB was the only one with a, with a U.S. Treasury hole in their balance sheet from Powell raising interest rates? Mm-hmm. No, they all are. They're all standing on it, which is why my local credit union, and I've been complaining about this for months, my local credit union won't give me more than 0.15% on my savings. Why? Because they can't afford to. They don't have, they, they don't have the, the, they don't have the balance sheet room. Powell just guaranteed their, the hole in their balance sheet a par. Now they can go out, they can hedge that, they, can, they, can, they, they have that risk, they, can, they have that position, they can go out and buy new treasuries at the new rate, and they can, have a balance, they can have a clean balance sheet. And now they can start offering savings rates, positive savings rates again. Which is something the you- banks just got the biggest shot in the arm they could have. And it's not a perfect solution. So I agree with Danielle completely on this. It's not a perfect solution, but it's the best solution you could have asked for given the circumstances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is which is something that you recently wrote about, you know, saying that everybody was basically once the once the market hit 5%, everybody pulled their money out and bought money market funds mm-hmm. rather than keeping their money in the banks because the banks right. can't pay them enough interest, right? I, I spoke with Ted Oakley last week, and he's like, "Yeah, I've I'm, I've been buying what it's like." Ted, what are you buying? He's like, "I don't know when the Fed's going to stop raising rates." And this is uh, we recorded that two days before us before before um, signature, uh, not signature, the first one, Silvergate Silicon. blew up, oh, and then right. SVB. Right? Mm-hmm. We recorded that on like Tuesday or Monday. It was Tuesday, and he was saying, "Oh, I'm buying variable rate U.S. Treasuries, and I'm going to wait until the uh, un- until the Fed stops hiking." At that mm-hmm. point, then I'll flip and go i'll flip and do something else mm-hmm. like exactly right you know you can't pick the top you can't pick the bottom you, you're not in control of that policy so you follow the policy and you right so a lot of people were doing what ted was talking about mm-hmm. and that's why the rp facility went from two and a half trillion down to two trillion five hundred billion dollars moved back into the money markets but again there are other ways to 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 to, to play that you know that have at you know as tax as ted was putting it you have you have, you have a more advantageous tax strategy by just going to the Fed, the Treasury directly, as opposed to you know buying money markets where you know you're paying capital gains on the interest. Right. So, but the incentives were already in there, and guess who doesn't have access to that? The rest of the world. What's important to understand here is that the Fed has created a sump pump for U.S. Treasury demand here in the U.S. banking system. So as the rest of the world, and this is, I'm, I'm getting, I, mean, I know I'm getting ahead of you. So I'm going to start talking about geopolitics and yep. all the rest of it, but you can see where I'm going. So the regional banks have been shored up. They don't have to worry now. We can let all of this play itself out for a few months, for a couple mm-hmm. weeks, a few months. We all, I'll transfer the contagion risk now. The, the interest rate risk, not the contagion risk, but the interest rate risk goes back overseas. And then we have contagion effects over there. But who cares? Because the American banks, decoupled from all of that since 2019's repo crisis, mm-hmm. which was started by JP Morgan, which effectively started a bank run on the old repo system by refusing to take as collateral at par European sovereign debt that was trading at negative 0.8%. Rightly so. I'm sure Jamie Dimon offered them 70 cents on the dollar, mm-hmm. and I'm sure Mario Draghi said no. And then I'm sure Jamie said, well, that's nice. We'll do something else with the money. You know, it's our money. It's our, our treasury. We, we, you know, piss off. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to keep it clean here. You know how, you know how salty I like to get. I'm trying to keep it clean. It's all good. So, you know, in that, in that vein, Tom, what has this done to the U.S. German bond spread, for example? You know, you, you right. posted two charts of that the other day, um, mm-hmm. you know, kind of in, in preparation for this, this chat. So how does that now, as you put it, you know, put, put that ball in, in the Euro's court? Really, and, okay. and transfer that risk, that that interest rate risk overseas. Okay, well, let's look at it this way: What is the ultimate safe haven asset in modern finance? Now, I'm not saying that it is, but in modern finance, Dollars. where can 
is the U.S. 10-year bond, right? Okay. It's the benchmark rate. Mm-hmm. So what I've been saying since the beginning of this is, well, we should watch for banking stress. We should watch for stress by watching the U.S.-German 10-year spread, right? Because what's the safe haven asset for the Eurozone system? The German Bund, right? So the German 210 spread is going to be important. Right. The U.S. German 10 year spread and two year spread should be important. And if there's big moves in those. And why was why did Christine Lagarde last July have her Mario Draghi moment where she said, I'm going to protect credit spreads. Mm -hmm. So. I'm like, okay, yeah, so I'm completely right about that, too. The point being is that we've seen a massive run into safe haven assets over the last four days. Gold is up one hundred dollars. Even silver's up even a little bit, but that's mostly just that's mostly just silver. You know, people still thinking that silver's a monetary metal. It's fine. It's good. I like silver. Just you know, not in a not in a disinflationary environment. Not in a tech negative environment because silver, as far as I'm concerned, is the industrial metal. It's it's the doctor copper of the tech sector, whereas copper is the is the leading indicator of manufacturing growth mm-hmm. and industrial growth. Right. Um, so. Gold's up 100 bucks. Massive, massive move into U.S. Treasuries. We also saw a massive move into German Treasuries, German Bunds. But the spreads have tightened. Remember, German debt is still trading at a premium to U.S. debt in terms of yield, right? So that spread tightening means that German debt is being sold faster than U.S. debt is, right? And it's dropped. So the U.S. the so the two year has dropped from spread has dropped from two point eight two point nine percent from last year down to one point four percent. The ten year spread has dropped from uh, a range between one point five and one point seven percent now to between one point two and one point three five percent. Lagarde's been managing this, but she can't she can't hold credit spreads without sacrificing something. You can protect credit spreads, or you can protect the euro, the currency, but you can't protect both simultaneously, mm-hmm. unless somebody else is buying your currency for you. The Brits, the Japanese. Okay, so that's part of the system that's been. That system is that is what's actually under pressure, and Lagarde is losing um, avenues. She's losing faucets with which to maintain credit spreads. Mm -hmm. And that's why we finally saw it transfer over to Europe today. So I also noted last week, so that's why the the, the German US credit spreads are so important because they're giving you an an indication of what the market is thinking about the credit worthiness of these two, of the banking, the relative banking systems of these two countries. With the Germans being a proxy, a, a proxy for the entire Euro, eurozone, and it's moving against them. Mm-hmm. And now is Lagarde trying to manage this so that there's not a bank, that there's not massive bank runs? Of course she is. Is that her, is that her job? Of course it is. Is she going to win? No, she's running out of bullets. And as one of my patrons put it to me the other day when we were discussing it like this, hey, I got news for you. Um, Lagarde's got bullets, plenty of them, but eventually she's going she's to run out. The Fed, can, the Fed can print more of their more of theirs and circulate the ones that she needs uh, analogous to the situation with I mean, actual honest to god lead based ammunition in between Russia and Ukraine the russians have industri- you know, industrial war production humming mm-hmm. they can produce all the 155 millimeter artillery shells that they want and the ukrainians have got to beg them off of uh, a, a an industrial um, segment here in the, in the west that is you know undergoing myocardial infarction so the liquidity is drying up mm-hmm. well that's actually you know something that i i wanted to get your take on is what does all of you know this this fight between euro dollars the dollar these regional banks what does all this have to do with the war in ukraine like it seems like there are no coincidences nowadays no there never are but I, before we go there tom i wanted i wanted i was hoping that you would pick up on the japan thing because i really want to talk about that real quick Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. No, that because I think this is an important thing that no one's touched on. Mm-hmm. Did anybody notice that this happened in the same week that Kuroda stepped down at the BOJ? 
Yeah, that's actually something I had I had in my notes, but there's you know so many yeah, so many, so many moving parts, right? Like, yeah. it, of course, Tom, I, I I get it. This is why I'm. This is why this is a conversation as 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 much as it is anything else, mm-hmm. because and I've teased this out a little bit because I had to think about it. But you know, Corotta was the architect of yield curve control. If you go back to Lehman Brothers again, and you think about the the, the and this is for the Murray Rothbard f- fans in the audience. So the London Gold Pool, I'm going to even back up to 1968, the year I was born. In 1968, the London Gold Pool fails. If you read, you know, um, what has government done to our money and, and the, the case for the 100% gold um, reserve standard, Rothbard talks about that whole breakdown of Bretton Woods, right? The London Gold Pool fails in 1968. We then have four, or three or four short-lived, like six or eight month long monetary systems to try and patch that system together. And then... It finally ends with Nixon closing the gold window on August 15th, 1971, birthing the dollar reserve standard, right? So three-year interregnum, right? The system fails in 68, and then a new one is born in 1971. Let's go to 2008. In 2008, the dollar reserve system fails. We have a whole bunch of people arguing amongst themselves as to what we're going to do. Oh, my God. And we try this. We try that. And that doesn't work. QE, this, that. Okay, wow. And then by September of 2011, what happens? What breaks the back of the gold bull market? The coordinating of policy by the major central banks, the SMB, the BOE, the BOJ, the, um, the ECB, and the Fed all get together, open up a $500 billion cross-currency swap line, break the, backs of, break the price of gold over a weekend, and birth the coordinated central bank standard, which lasted until Powell raised the reverse repo rate by five basis points on June 16th, 2021. Mm-hmm. So let's look at those five central banks. Who hasn't changed policy yet? The Fed has. Even the ECB started raising rates. Mm-hmm. The BOE was the first one to raise rates. The SNB, they depegged from the euro starting all of this. the BOJ. The BOJ is still doing yield curve control. Now, for months, I was saying I thought that the Bank of Japan being a geopolitical ally of the United States, that meant that Kuroda was being the Fed's wingman, giving the, you know, when the when Powell wanted a strong dollar, Kuroda gave it to him. And when, and when Powell wanted a, you know, wanted a weaker dollar to have the dollar back off, you know, Kuroda was his wingman. I, I have completely revised that. So again, must remain flexible when you're all, again, I, I, I say this all the time. I LARP is a bond guy, right? I LARP is, I, I am learning this as we go here, guys. I just, maybe I'm really good at, at, at assimilating information, but I'm in constant improvement road, constantly trying to learn like everybody else is. And I hadn't really given this changeover at the BOJ much thought until I started seeing proximate causes of things starting to happen around the changeover. And then I realized, and then I thought about it for a second, and I went, you know, let me think about this. Let's go find out why Ueda is now the head of the BOJ. I don't know anything about this guy. Let's go, let's go do a little research. Let's actually go do some work and stop producing content for a little bit. What did I find? I found a great article from the Nikkei with an interview from Amania, who, is, who was Kuroda's vice chair, who turned the job down. And he turned it down because he said, quote, yeah, not quote, but effectively quote, because I was part of the, the system that produced this policy. I don't believe that I'm the right person to be objective in trying to figure out what the next policy for Japan should be going forward. That is, and I'm doing this for the good of Japan. This is a very nice way of saying in an honor based system, this guy just turned down the ultimate prize, the ultimate um, honor that he was supposed, it was supposed to be his turn. And he turned it down and gave those reasons. Now that to me, and then handed saying like, you know, if you look at the trend in central bankers, we have guys like Jerome Powell who are not part of the old monetary system. Like we're all, we were all trained, me, my predecessor, my, you know, you know Kuroda, you know, um, uh, Yellen, Bernanke, and whatnot, we're all trained as academics. 
We didn't have any real world experience. Maybe like we're seeing with Jerome Powell over in the United States, we need people with real world experience running the central banks. That is a tell. That's a major tell. And the major tell is that Ueda is going to reverse, is going to end QE in Japan. He's going to change monetary policy. He's not going to do it tomorrow. He didn't change anything coming in. But what happened with the Japanese 10-year bond in the last three days? Remember, Kuroda raised the yield curve control, raised the, the, raised the limit he was going to defend to 0.5% in December, admitting that he has an inflation problem. In the last finally <laughs> five days, yes, finally, exactly. In the last five days, including the weekend, the Japanese 10-year this morning is trading at 23 basis points. Carry trades are unwinding. The short JGB, short the JGB 10-year, because you know the because you know the 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 Bank of Japan has got your back on the on that short. It's not going to allow it to, to, to not going to allow it to move against you. You're fine. And then you can go buy some long. I don't know, Germany, the United States, whatever. You can play duration risk. You can play credit spread risk. You can do whatever you want. You've got a guarantee. And they were the last carry trade currency. And I mentioned this on Twitter the other day, just putting it out there. And I said, I think your weight is going to end the yield curve control. And Francis Hunt, the market sniper, Francis Hunt came back to me and he said, that's why I'm long the euro, the, the euro yen cross. And I went, and then I linked that article to him. I said, Francis, I would be really worried about that. And the Euro Yen Cross was trading at 145 when we had that conversation this morning is at 140. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, can you can you put those pieces together a bit more a bit easier for people to understand? For the average you know, person, like, right. I'm sorry. I I'm jumping it, all over the place here. I'm sorry. It's like, absolutely it's like your head will spin when you start to think about this stuff. What it means is that. The Bank of Japan's yield curve control program was underwriting Lagarde's credit spread maintenance programs. That's what it really means. And with a changeover in the potentially a changeover in policy at the BOJ means that she's going to lose that support as well. And credit spreads are now and the market is beginning to sniff out that that's what's going to happen, which is why the market today in the last couple of days since the blow up on Friday has been, you know, there's been buying of the Japanese JGB 10 years because guys are covering their shorts. So they're going along, they're having to cover their shorts and buy the, te- the buy the 10 year back and then unwind the trade, which is why the Euro Yen cross got screwed. And it's why um why credit spreads are 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 tightening between Germany and, and the US. And it's why Christine and it's why Christine Lagarde had to let the euro uh, drop by two percent this morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was actually kind of where I was going to go with with that analogy when you were saying about Lagarde needing to defend those credit spreads. Mm-hmm. That was like the situation that we saw in Japan when they had to either sell, basically defend their currency or defend that peg, right? Right. Defend their ten year peg. Right. Exactly. And they let and they didn't de- they didn't defend it all the way up to one fifty, and then they did defend it back into the low one thirties. And, you know, is, you know, and what are, what's the Japan going to do now? Are we finally seeing the unwind, the beginnings of the unwinding of Abenomics? I started studying Japan back in 2011 when I was working with my, my the broker over in Vietnam. And we were studying those markets back then. And I said, look, the Japanese yen is trading at 75 to the dollar. Japan is all over Southeast Asia building factories with this strong yen and offsetting their demographic collapse. That you know the Peter Zahan, Kyle Bass types like to like to tell everybody is 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 the end of the world by buying up a whole bunch of well-educated, young and hungry Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian, Malaysian, Indonesian, Philippines. They're, they're, they were they were spreading, and then Abe comes in when the United States when they when they when Japan was getting too close to China, Abe was put in power and and put the kibosh on all that. Mm-hmm. Now. You know, as a geopolitical analyst back then, I was a neophyte. I just saw this and went, oh, okay, well, that changes things. So that, you know, why that was done beyond that. But Abenomics since then has been to keep the yen weak and under yield curve control. But it was in 2011. Again, it's in 2011 when they needed to architect the new system. And in order to defend the euro, 
they had to trash the end. So I guess, you know, I think of it now, it's actually really quite obvious. So if they're going to reverse that, then clearly my, my longstanding call that the euro is going to break peg with the dollar, uh, is going to break parity with the dollar and go to 60 or 70 cents is potentially on the table. Tom, I think one of the the other important points that you've made here that that I've even tried to wrap my head around and and read as much as I can about it, but I'd like you to help explain it to to our listeners is understanding mm-hmm. this difference between LIBOR and SOFR and 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 why that change in those markets is occurring and and what that important date of of June of this year is kind of coming down that pipe. The LIBOR versus SOFR debate is a very important one. Now, in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, SOFR went onto the drawing board at the Federal Reserve. Obama was elected, selected, whatever you want to call it, put in power. No way at that time we had a choice between him and John McCain. Do you think John McCain was going to do anything different than Obama? Do you think Mitt Romney would have done anything different than Obama? No, of course not. LIBOR is the means by which is the underwriting interest rate for the euro dollar future system, which is, again, part of Jeff Snyder's argument. But LIBOR is going away. It's no longer the, it's no longer the rate um, for the price of US dollars. That means that anything written against um, overseas, any debt within the shadow, when those dollars that are sitting in offshore dollar accounts and then get levered up and then get lent out again, they get lent out at LIBOR. So their cost is based on you know, LIBOR. It's not based on a different um, index, right? It's based on that. And if LIBOR, if those loans go bad, if the banks get into trouble, blah, 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 then LIBOR blows out. It doesn't matter what's happening in the United States. If LIBOR blows out, City of London has control over U.S. interest rate policy, which is why every time there's been an inversion in the euro-dollar futures curve, the Fed has to pivot, especially if the Fed was compliant because it was under Bernanke and Yellen, the central bank of the world, as opposed to the central bank for the United States. Lagarde, in 2021, a week and a half before the before Powell raised the RRP rate, you know, brought out the Klaus Schwab, George Soros, we have talking point, we have to coordinate internet, we have to coordinate global monetary policy to support climate change. And Powell said, you know what? No, I have a dual mandate, stable prices, full employment. We can argue whether that those mandates are mutually exclusive or not. That's a different yeah. podcast. Yeah. But that's his mandate. That's code for I'm the central banker of the United States. I don't care about you. Lagarde lost her mind. Two weeks later, Powell started the process of draining her capital markets. And and everything since then has been nothing more than a rear guard action to try and get rid of Powell and or force his hand to go back to the zero bound, which is what everybody argues because everybody believes that Jeff Snyder version of the argument that euro dollars rule the world. I don't. Because, well, maybe it's because I'm disagreeable, maybe because I'm, it's because I'm Italian, or maybe it's because I can read tea leaves, but I sit here like Paul Volcker, I smoke cheaper cigars than him, and go, you know what? No. I'm in charge of the dollar. I'm the big dog. You're the pretender. If I want to raise the price of dollars, I will but I can't do so if I don't have a mechanism by which to decouple my banking system from yours. So the big threat, and this is the important, this is the story that I think everybody is. If I tell the story this way, most people will get it because it has to do with politics. Ask yourself why they hated Donald so much. And it had nothing to do with the fact that he's a boorish, you know, cheesy property developer from Queens. It's not that he was outside the system. It was that once Trump was in power, Wall Street 
And the New York banks saw the opportunity to finally pull SOFR off the shelves and begin the process of implementing it and changing the entire structure of the global banking system to one based on a US-centric rate that is collateralized and not just the opinions of 18 banks sitting in the city of London smoking cheap cigars and having tea at five o'clock in the afternoon. Those philosopher kings no longer rule the roost. The, the markets, the repo markets here, the domestic repo markets here in the United States and the Federal Reserve rule the roost. It's a five-year rollout plan they put in place, but they can't stop it at that point because Wall Street has de decided that it can't be stopped Unle because they had the right guy in as Federal Reserve chair to shepherd the first four years of it. They put John Williams in it the head, as the head of the New York Fed who was the architect of SOFR and its chief operating, the guy running the program. Mm -hmm. And they all complained bitterly about this back in 2017. Go, go read the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal or any, anybody from that period. And you'll see the, the, the amount of vitriol level at John Williams being appointed to the New York Fed was almost as bad as Donald Trump. Because they understood then that they were they were going to lose control of over U.S. monetary policy if this thing was actually rolled all the way out, which is why in 2021 they had to try and get rid of Powell and not get him in as a second term. And then they could have pushed Sofer's full rollout out to 2026 or 2030, and just say you know what they've been doing with Basel three, you know, and all that stuff. Like oh, we're not ready for it. We'll just push it off. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because it's not to our advantage you have to push it off because we can't make it work. So that's in broad strokes what's going on. And then once it was clear that that's what they were going to do, once it, you know, once as SOFR went through each of the phases of the roll in um, at various points, that's when you started seeing New York make its move against Davos. But they didn't have the weapon necessary to fight the battle. The tail really did wag the dog. And the dog was sick. It was the only part of the dog that was even, you know, moving. Mm -hmm. Once Sofer goes into place, the dog gets back up on its own two feet and starts barking. Right. So, Tom, if you could help us understand, you know, the the seemingly op op opposition or, or, you know, the diametric opposition of Yellen versus Powell here. And why Yellen is such a, a political animal here? I think she's a true believer. I, it's, I, it, that's the only thing I got. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think she's all that smart either. But that's just me. And, you know, again, that's my opinion. And, um, you know, you can, you know, that's my opinion. So I'm not trying to libel Janet Yellen. All I'm saying is that, you know, Yellen was put in place to do a job. She put off rate hikes for at least a year longer than she was supposed to. Why? She didn't put, she started raising rates in order to try and blame Powell for continuing to raise rates. Same with Kuroda. Kuroda held on to yield curve control far longer than he was supposed to. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because Yellen is a true believer in, you know, this, I wouldn't even call it Keynesianism. I would call it Samuelsonian, right? It's more, really more Paul Samuelson and his, textbook, which was the dominant economics textbook in the United States for 35 years, which was Paul Samuelson's interpretation of John Maynard Keynes' um, general theory. Again, go back and listen to Walter Block and all the Mises guys. They talk about this innumerable podcast from 2008 through 2012, where they talked about this stuff ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. Like, it's great stuff. There's a tremendous archives of this stuff. This is where I cut. This is when I really began to, to turn the corner of my understanding of all this stuff. And then it then I had to like learn how to be a Bond guy. Oh, I didn't want to be. <laughs> I really didn't. It's like I don't want to be here, but I am. Like mm -hmm. life takes you where you need to go, right? The well, universe puts you in a place to do what you needed to do. And you know, you say quite frequently that you changed the way you look at markets to be more of a political and a geopolitical analyst because these are political markets versus you know just just fundamentals. Yeah. So, and we would like to get away from politicized markets. Absolutely. So let's look at this week as another step on the path 
back towards less politicized markets by taking power. What's the problem with politics? What's the problem with money in politics? It's that there's money in politics, mm -hmm. right? So you got to figure out a way to get rid of the money. When money is free, you have an infinite, you have the opportunity for almost infinite leverage. With infinite leverage comes the subsidization of bad ideas like communism. It's simple. Or, mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, stakeholder capitalism. Communism. Get over yourselves. Um, everybody, you know, like, and if you know, I, and again, I say this to the audience all the time if you want to, if you want to play word games, that's great. But I don't play word games because commies play word games. Okay, I don't play with def I don't play with definitions. I play with facts, and then I build opinions based on those facts because I have imperfect information. But I'm never unclear about what the terms of my debate are. Mm -hmm. These people are just communists. That's it. It's not that hard. Okay, and every time they try to sell you something else, they use a euphemism for it because they don't because they know commies. They know communism is a dirty word. It is. Mm -hmm. Should be. 200 million people dead in the 20th century because of this. Like, Putin hates communism. He calls it a European idea that you people gave to us to destroy Russia. We don't want it. That's your idea. You keep it. <laughs> he doesn't, I he, Putin's no capitalist. Mm -hmm. You know, he's no free market capitalist, but, eh, you know, maybe he will be. He's flexible in his thinking, knowing he, he knows what tools he needs to have at a particular moment in time to get through, to, to garner you know, to, to, to marshal, to fight, you know, his current enemies. And that's the way I think Powell is. I think Powell's a capitalist mm -hmm. in a classic sense, not in the, you know, not in the, the communist contrived definition of capitalism, which is corporatism as capitalism and the zero sum game of Marxist thinking. Economics is not a zero-sum game. And anybody who ever argues a zero-sum game in this stuff is selling you something. And they're selling you a very pernicious idea. Mm -hmm. And if they can't sell you, if they can't sell you on an economic theory or a monetary theory based on the law of diminishing marginal utility, they're lying to you. And property rights, they're lying to you. Mm -hmm. That's simple. I'm not, I'm not defending the Fed. I'm defending the Fed's desire to, to survive. And I'm defending the Fed's desire to maintain some form of seat at the table. They know they're losing the bigger, broader fight for the definition of money. We can either go full MMT and unmoor money completely from even debt, from even debt serfdom, and just go to direct serfdom central bank digital currencies, or we can go back to a commodity standard. And if you look, and you asked about Russia and China and the war in Ukraine and all of that, the East or everything East, and I'm, I'm now, I'm out like the, the North, international North-South transport corridor, and I think is now the, the best new border for the world. Everything East of the international North-South transport corridor is moving towards a commodity-based system, commodity-based monetary system. Whether Sergey Glazyev is correct or not, I happen to think he's just a Keynesian who likes gold, which is, he's a weirdo. Uh, but I don't think he's wrong about everything, but I think he's wrong about many things. Um, but he's certainly better than Yellen. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make him right. It makes him better, right? <laughs> um, but everything in the west of the international north-south transport corridor, that's from St. Petersburg down to the port at Chabahar in, uh, on, the, in, on the Indian Ocean in Iran. Um, wants the old wants the old system levered up again. I think Powell understands that you can't fight a superior money in the wrong in the long run, right? And uh, uh, and all you can do is enforce an inferior money onto the market with guns, and those guns form and those and this is where you go. We'll go back to Ron Paul. You make things legal tender, it's a gun. It's a law. And behind the law, law is a gun. So the dollar was overvalued because we made it more valuable 
we made it cheaper to transact than gold by forcing people to use it and then setting up structures that made it difficult for people to trade gold. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you know, there, you know, at, at some point, technology, you know, the sanctions, all of the things that I wrote about in the, in the last article I, I put, I put up the, um, the war for the dollar is over part two, the flyer, the windshield, right? That's the name of the articles on my blog over at Tomalana.me. And I go over the process of how you go from one old system to a new one. Like I described with Sofer, it took five years to put it in place. Well, it's the same thing with the, with a commodity backed, um, trade settlement system on which you can build a new monetary system that, that they're building east of the North-South Transport Corridor, you get that, you get there by slowly building the foundation, the relationships, the trust, the infrastructure, moving, you know, emerging Iranian and Russian banks, allowing for cross-border trade, but eventually everybody just settles up in digital gold tokens and you know, and they, as long as they trust each other and as long as they don't try and, you know, screw each other, then the system will work. And as long as the West continues to fight that, their trust in each other will be higher than their trust in the West. And therefore, it doesn't have to be a perfectly trustless system, Bitcoiners. It just has to be better. That's it. In the game of global capital, you, it's not, you don't have to be good. You just have to be better than the other guy. Right. And capital will flow right over there. And if you don't believe me, $42 billion flowed out of SBB in four hours or whatever the hell it was. Got news for you. Capital flows quickly today because Jim Bianco was actually right about this. Uh, he wrote a great thread on Twitter about this on saying, look. Transferring money on your phone. You can transfer money on your phone. You can do this. You can do that. Right. So, you know, hat tip to Jim on that, on that point. It was a great point he made. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, like this is where we are. So, you know, Exactly. In that thought, Tom, mm. you know, we see all these moves by Russia and China, the, the BRICS nations to possibly, you know, start their new their new trading currency. If let's say Powell gets what he wants and he builds this strong dollar, does mm. that become a bigger threat or do they somehow coexist? How do you see that playing out? I, I see it this way. Powell had to shore up the U.S. Treasury market. And the, and the bid for the U.S. Treasury market outside of the euro dollar system as a defense against de-dollarization. The Biden administration is trying to get us into World War III, right? Well, what did Russia do before they started the war in Ukraine? They dumped all their U.S. Treasury bonds in a month. Mm -hmm. That was only $100 billion. We absorbed it. We moved on. The Chinese has still have $870 billion. They've been divesting. They're going to continue to divest. They could dump $870 billion worth of treasuries on the market in a month. We have to have the ability to suck that up. Or Xi and Powell understand what the real problem is. It's the Biden administration. It's Davos. You cut those people off. You make deals with Saudi Arabia and Iran. Get them to, to bury the hatchet. You get you know, you, you, you come in and you help shore up Erdogan in Turkey. You, get, you come in and you put money and diplomacy. Look, Xi is on a charm tour of the entire uh, uh, um, pressure point. All of the pressure points, you know, around the Mediterranean and the Black Sea and the Caspian, you know, and the charm tour, all of it, saying this is what needs to happen. And eventually you'll see that Europe keeps losing out on all these deals. Europe has been cut out completely of all these deals. The United States and China are decoupling. Jim, I just read an interview with Jim Rickards the other day. I'm oh, sorry, the, the other day, the other hour. I read it this morning. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason why you and I were a little late this morning is I was a little late getting my work done this morning that I had to do for my patrons before you and I sat down to chat. And, um, and he was saying, look, you know, the decoupling between the United States and China is real. The, United, the, the Chinese don't want to deal with us and we don't want to deal with that. Fine. No problem, but we have to decouple. And how are you going to do that? Well, if the if Powell creates a, a, a an incentivized flow and a superior landscape for U.S. Treasuries to be reonshored, then the Chinese can dump and it won't kill us. Mm -hmm. 
and, 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 and by extension them either. Right. And, mm-hmm. and the rest of the world, because if, if I was, I was having this conversation with a listener the other day and they said, you know, what stops China or, or any of these countries, Japan, for example, from just dumping bonds. And I said, well, or, or their treasuries. And it's like, that doesn't really serve anybody because if they just dump all of them on the market, the value goes down for everyone. And that bid goes to zero. Right. Well, moreover, and Martin Armstrong keeps saying, and the Chinese have no incentive, given this administration, to to hold on to those bonds. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because, you know, Biden can just wake up one morning and cancel all the Q-tips. Like, like if you, you don't think they're going to do that? What did they do to Russia last year? Mm-hmm. Or did everybody forget 13 months ago? So the whole world saw that and went, oh, my God, I, I can't be in these things anymore. They're not safe. And if they're not safe, then the bid on them goes away and everything ta- everything is bad. You raise the cost. What? Why did the dollar take over the world? Because it was the cheapest currency to transact in. It was the most it was the safest legal jurisdiction. It was had all of these pillars. And what have these dollars just done? Undermine every one of those institutions and every one of those pillars to re- to replace them with what? European communism? Nobody in the world wants this other than Ursula von der Leyen and all these freaking horrible people. I mean, dudes, like, we'll fight Jamie Dimon later. The Nazis are real. They're... No, no, I, I, I start when this starts. When I start really thinking about this stuff, that's when like the fourteen-year-old me sitting in there on the, the you know, I channeling my grandfather talking in pigeon Italian for Christ's sake, mm-hmm. like uh, trying not to swear in Italian in front of the five-year-old. Okay, that's my grand. That's my grandfather. And I learned all this pigeon Italian and thought thought it was actually Italian. It's not. <laughs> I didn't know any better. We didn't speak Italian in the household. Mm-hmm. But and like oh, Maron, I, Maron, Maron to me, which is you know, you know, like this, this is my family. This is I start like going back to that, right? Oh, that guy comes out, you know, you, you know, when that guy comes out, forget it. Like you don't want me as that of the Federal Reserve. Interest rates are already being nine percent. <laughs> like, so no, and I, and 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 I'm putting out hit squads on freaking Christine Lagarde because she just needs to be, you know, like, like this is bad. These people are mass murderers. They're thieves. They're all of this, and they are the worst people imaginable because they are unbelievably arrogant. Who believe that the rest of the world exists to serve them? They are neo-colonialists in their thinking. They are nothing more. They see us as the help. I have said this a thousand times, mm-hmm. and it's so very true. This is not Europeans. This is the European elites. This is the people who run the European Union. This is the people who run all of these European, the, all of these international globalist um, uh, institutions, the OECD, the WTO, the IMF, the BIS, the EU, are all, the, even the UN, they're all designed to normalize terrible situations. Like they want maximized tax policy. They want, the, you know, so they, and they, and they couch it in terms of, well, it's not fair. Your taxes are too low. Our, well, our taxes are really high in France, so you should be, you should have the same tax structure we have, so that we have a level playing field. Like, no, yeah, we have a level playing field. Why don't you cut taxes forty percent, Macron? Your people want it. No, we can't do that. Well, why not? Uh, because, I'm like, yeah, because you're a commie. Shut up. And I, I hate the like, I, I, you know, all the technical stuff is great, Tom, but at a certain point, this is what markets are not. Emotionless. They're not bloodless. This is this is people's lives you're playing with. These are this is this is your children's future. This is all of these things. It's why I'm sitting here on a porch in a house I built myself in preparation for becoming a father because I didn't want my kid growing up in Gainesville. Okay, that's how insane I was. I built a house in the middle of a Florida summer in the eighth circle of Dante's hell. Mm-hmm. One of the hottest places on the planet. I lost 20 pounds that summer. I look good, but you know. (sighs) Like economics, it's all got its (laughs) trade-offs. Yeah, it's all trade-offs. And was it the right thing to do? I don't know. I am I still paying am I paying for you know those decisions then? Oh yeah. (laughs) But whatever. Like it's led you to where you are today. But that's what, but these are the 
But when you when you see that far into the future, when you see what's on the horizon, you know, yeah, you might get paranoid. I, what I'm trying to do now is to get people to not be paranoid about this and to see the logical incentives of the people who are at play and go, look, they may not, they they may have to cut deals that no one's happy with. Mm-hmm. So when you listen to the Austro Libertarian or the alt finance sect complaining about moral hazard and bailouts to the rich and all this stuff, and then you look at what was actually put in place, you say, well, look, no, neither side's happy about this. That's probably a good deal. In diplomacy, if neither side is happy, it's probably a good deal. Mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's the the the, the TLDR on 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 Silicon Valley Bank. Because it does, like I said, I think it does set up the, the 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 virtuous incentive cycle to um, to shore up the, the the regional banking system and put the pressure on the offshore shadow banks that have ruled the world since the 1960s. Mm-hmm. And the only the only other piece I wanted to touch on that the the currency idea of the last question of you know, maybe the BRICS nations that whatever that currency is going to be called and the U S dollar working together, how could the U S or the world re-monetize gold? You know, an idea that you've talked about recently was the idea of those long dated bonds with a gold redemption clause. Can you explain to us a little bit about that? Sure. And that's, and that's one of the paths. And I think it's the easiest path because look, if let's just put it this way, and again, in terms of hey, um, you want capital to remain in your system, you got to treat it better than the system that the other guys got. Mm-hmm. Well, that system is remonetizing gold, and is willing to you know give you bearer assets or at least claim the bearer assets, and a structure by which you can get to bearer assets at the end. That's pretty powerful. If you've got a system over here that's walling off every app, every opportunity to get the bearer assets, that's not so. If you want your financial system to remain solvent, you want that inferior financial system to remain solvent, you're going to have to raise your game. Like I said earlier, um, France, your tax system stinks. So why don't you make it look more like the American tax system and then capital will flow to you as opposed to trying to force capital out of the United States so that it doesn't leave you, right? So two fundamentally different approaches, the carrot and the stick. Right, the fly or the windshield. So, what I've said, and I'm just riffing off of stuff that I've heard other people say. Judy Shelton is, I think, the one who ultimately, who originally floated this idea, was that look, we can throw girl as as Vince Lanchi would put it, we can throw gold out on the yield curve. <laughs> we can issue a low dollar coupon, long dated U.S. Treasury, if we commit to fiscal, to fixing the fiscal problems. We have to commit to them, though. I don't know that we're 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 in the headspace to do this. I think we're uh, rapidly approaching that moment. I think the world is telling us we have to get to that moment. So let's just throw the number out there. So say you've got a ten thousand dollar bond with a thirty year bond with a five percent gold cover clause, meaning at the end of the bond, at the end of the thirty years, you're going to get. $500 of that, of your original, at, when you bought the bond, $500 of today's, of gold in today's numbers, today's value, $1,900 an ounce, is going to be put, is, is what that bond is worth on maturity. You're going to get $9,500 back plus X number of grams of gold equal to whatever the gold price is on the day that you bought the bond, mm-hmm. that the bond was issued. On the when issued, as Zero Hedge would put it for the, uh, the, the treasury auction. So now you're going to get a 2% or 3% US dollar coupon, but then you're also at the end still going to get that amount of gold. Well, doesn't that incentivize the Federal Reserve to allow the price of gold to rise if it needs to? Because now investors in the United States can realize actual honest to God yield above the 3% coupon or 2% or 3% coupon, and they get the price appreciation of, of the gold as well. So say gold triples to you know, $5,700 an ounce. Well, your $500 in gold is now worth $1,500. And over the 30 years, you get that $1,000 and you know, added to your, to your yield. So the real yield on the bond is higher than the dollar coupon payment. <laughs> Just it, it won't take a lot to get this done. But all of those outstanding 
all of those um, unfunded liabilities, Social Security, Medicare, the demographic shifts that we have coming. And we're mostly through the, we're like, we're halfway through the baby boomers and we're still arguing about this stuff. Like it's 2008 for Christ's sake. We're halfway through the baby boomers retiring. I'm about to retire, right? I'm 55. I'm nine years away from, you know, being able to cash in a Roth and, you know, without penalty. And I like, I'm like, like I'm there. Like I'm in that window now. Mm-hmm. Right. So I only have to buy health insurance for another 10 years. Right. So blah, blah, blah. blah. So, I mean, when you, when you start to do the, the math on this, the unfunded liability problem, while big, can be solved as long as Congress does, you know, repudiates Keynesian budgeting, doesn't do countercyclical deficit spending at this moment in time. Powell came out the other day and said at the Humphrey Hawkins testimony, when asked by Cynthia Loomis, you know, do you care about, do you take into consideration um, the fiscal position of Congress when you set monetary policy? He's like, no. Period. No but, no comma, no. That said, do I believe that the United States can service our existing debt pile? To which he said, yes, without equivocation. But it's going to take a, fun, but no worse than what we currently have, was really what he said. And you guys are now going to have to figure out a way to change the way you do business in Washington, D.C., that happened, and two days later, Biden puts out this ridiculous freaking budget, which is trying to force get more deficit spending onto the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve to get them to fit, pivot back to the zero balance. Mm-hmm. But again, do we want good ideas to 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 propagate? Not propagate, propagate. Then maybe we should get our fiscal house in order. Let's do the Ron Paul thing. What's today? It's 2022, 2023's budget. How about we go back to 2020? How about we go back to 2018's budget? Could we live on taking a haircut on spending back to 2018's budget? Just like when Ron was running for president in 2012, he said, hey, let's go back to 2008's budget. How about Rand Paul's idea? Let's cut the budget by one cent per program per year. 1%. Let's take a penny out of every dollar spent by the current departments everywhere across the board. They wouldn't even feel the, they wouldn't even feel it. But if we did that every year for 10 years and and at the on the other side of it, respond to a potential, you know, gold backed currency from the BRICS or the BRICS, B-R-I-I-C-S-S, including Saudi Arabia now and India and Iran. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, it's possible. I could even go one step further and say Brazil is no longer part of the BRICS, but I, I actually have more hope for Pakistan. So then we get into a really yeah, <laughs> a non a not a not safe for a <laughs> work environment acronym at that point from bricks <laughs> to um but that's just I'm just I'm just I'm just riffing at this point. But that's the basic idea. Mm-hmm. And it's doable and everybody knows it's doable. And the commercial banking system in the United States wants it. The community banks are screaming for it. Like the only people who are not who are screaming against it are the freaking commies on Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. So do away with the commies. Stop listening to Lizzie Slapaho. I mean Elizabeth Warren, and be done with it. Let's just move on. So, so Tom, looking forward, you said you would have raised interest rates to nine percent already. So only you know, only looked at me sideways. What's that? Really, I've always said let's go to six, mm-hmm. possibly seven, and I really do think that a six percent terminal rate rings all of the stuff out. But again, I'm just picking, I'm kind of picking a number out of, out of top, off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I take a lot of guff from people saying, oh, Powell's going to pivot. He's going to stop here at 4.75 and you'll be wrong. And are you going to admit it? I'm like, if he, Powell's going to do whatever, in, whatever he has political cover to do. As Daniel DiMartino Booth has pointed out multiple times, shrinking the balance sheet is more important. Shrinking the flow of dollars is more important because that's what actually drains the leverage from the system. Interest rates are one angle on this. QT is the other angle on this. And if you're not willing to be flexible because you just want to believe that you're right and you want to catch some catch some some gadfly, some guy you disagree with, and they go, who gotcha? Like, you want to play gotcha politics on Twitter, you go right ahead. You're still going to be wrong. It doesn't matter. You know, when, I'm, when we're sitting here 10 years from now, 
and I've been right about 90% of it and you've been wrong about everything and you're still waiting for Powell to pivot. You know, that's nice. I'm, have a nice day. I don't really care. <laughs> I don't need to be right. A lot of people out there need to be right. That's the thing you got to watch for within the commentary app. Is there a lot of people out there who need to be right? They don't want to be right. They need to be right. I don't need to be anything. I need to just show up every day and give people my very, very best. And that is not going to happen every day. There are going to be days when I get it wrong. Mm-hmm. We all get it wrong. Like it's just the world, right? But well, like you, you know, say, you're you're constantly open to new information, new ideas, constantly reassessing. And that's what I appreciate about your analysis and the ideas that you bring to the table. You know, I listen to every one of your episodes because it always, you know, makes me think in such a broader sense about how all these pieces fit together. Right. That's what I'm focused on. I, I have to be focused on that because I'm not good at, at the plumbing. I mean, I'm really not. Like, again, I'd, ra- I'd rather put those ideas out there and then for the guys who know the plumbing to be inspired to tell me, yeah, you're right about that, but you're wrong about this. Mm-hmm. I'm like, cool. Where am I wrong and why? All right. You know, when I, when I first sat down to, to chat with Vince Lanchi for the first time, you know, I really have a, 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 a you know, off, off camera. We were chatting before we did the podcast. He's like, finding out that you're a chemist makes so much more sense as to how you go, uh, how you go about this. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, well, you know, I've, I've gone broke in the markets multiple times and I put hypotheses on the table that were wrong. Like there are two things in this life that are going to kick your ass more than anything else, the markets and sci- and real science. Mm-hmm. And then you got to, and you got to react in real time and you always have to be willing to do a corrective action report on your own behavior and your own ideas along with, a, you know, what you put in, what policies and what decisions you've made. And especially if you've ever done any kind of process improvement. Remember I did, I did five years as a research and industrial in a, a research chemist for an industrial process that was, had no, statistical controls on it, had no ability to, to produce a final product that was saleable to the customers. And, you know, again, not patting, not busting my hand, patting myself on the back. This is the kind of thing I did where I took a, uh, I took a novel plating, novel nickel boron, electroless nickel boron plating bath that was 30% first pass yield, meaning three out of every 10 parts we we played it, we're good, we can send back to the customer. And I got it to 99% in five years. Mm-hmm. Now, that, now, maybe you think that's, that's what industry that industry normally does. No. 90% on old technologies, well-understood technologies that are 50 years old are 90% first pass yield. I went to 99. So that's the kind of work that got done to do that. Now you don't think I don't have the skill set to be flexible. And do you think I fa- you think I did? You think I was just a? You think it was a straight line up? No. God, oh my! The first three years were horrible. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't even have a background in electrochemistry for Christ's sake or metallurgy. None of it. Mm-hmm. But that's who I am, guys, and that's who I've always been, and that's why I can come into this thing today and do the things that I'm doing. But at the same time, you know, again, I could be wrong. I, you know, I'm just some guy on the internet with an idea. Please error check. Please don't, you know, and if I'm wrong, but you're going to need to have your ducks in order. Yeah, absolutely. So. Well, Tom, I think that's a good place to wrap this up considering, considering that, you know, you're, you're opening that, that floor to error correction and hopefully somebody that has a better thesis and or way that all the puzzle pieces fit together. And yeah. I, I'm sure that you're going to be happy to have that discussion. If we, I do. would, I, I would be fantastic. Tommy, you have no idea how much I would appreciate somebody going, no, no, no you're right about this, but not this. Mm-hmm. Like, really cool. Let's do a podcast. Absolutely. Let's, let's get it out there. Mm-hmm. Teach me. I want to learn. You got to be, you know, uh, one of the things that I've, I've always thought, and this is just phil- kind of philosophically, you know, I'm like, if you want to, if you're at a point in your life where you don't want to learn anything else, are you alive? Because 
it's at the moment, you know, there's always something new to learn, even if it's not in your, you know, the thing that you do for a living or, you know, there's always something new to go learn about mm -hmm. and get better at every day. Like, this is why I, you know, try and get behind the drum kit a couple of times a week. It's why I try and, you know, you know, try and do different things. And, and, you know, even when I go to my board game night, when we get done with this, I'm going to do, I, I, I get the, I get the jack out for a few hours. Like, even if I'm going to lose a game, my goal is always a personal best, mm -hmm. right? In some point salad Euro game that I don't know very well. Like my goal, my goal is always, well, like the last time I played this game, I, I scored 110. Oh yeah, yeah. So fine. My 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 friend over there scored 150 and he's gonna win. I know he's gonna win, but my goal is 111 or 112 or 115 or 120. Mm -hmm. And then I know that I'm on the right path to uh, unlocking this puzzle. Mm -hmm. And that's what these are. These are all puzzles, but they're puzzles. But when you talk about this stuff, it's these are puzzles that um are you know that go to the core of who we are and the world we want to live in. And that's what's really important. I know that's why you do this. I, you know, that's why I do this. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, that's why, oh, and ultimately Tom, I think that's why we're going to win mm -hmm. because, well, that's, those, because the other, because the other people are only doing it. They're, they're doing it. They're doing it to, to, to shore up holes in their, in their, um, in their psyche and their, in their, in their conception of themselves. There's a hole that they're trying to fill that they can't. That they can, that only power can give them, and I'm not interested in power. I'm interested in. I'm interested in. Ha I'm interested in putting myself out of a job, to be honest with you. So I can go do something. I can do something fun with my life. Yeah, right? yeah, that's a, a great way to put it. And th that's what I was going to say is I'm I'm constantly humbled and, you know, grateful to have conversations like this and even the offline ones that we have, um, right, with anybody that I interview, yourself included, and, you know, learning learning all the time is something that I take, you know, really great pleasure in because I spend at very minimum an hour for every single one of these interviews to make sure that I know exactly where everybody's expertise is. Yes. And to be, to be perfectly honest, I spend extra time trying to prepare for a conversation with you because there's so many different, um, you know, pieces that I feel that I have to cover and be prepared for so that I can make sure that I maximize my time with you. Uh, well, you know, Tom, that's high praise. Thank you. Um, and I, I appreciate that. I really do. I don't know what else to say other than that's high praise. And, um, and I'm always happy to, to give you my time and uh, have one of these. And, you know, as long as we don't overdo it such that, you know, it, it gets boring because they should always be, they should always, there should always be something interesting to talk, something new. It's new wrinkle on this stuff to talk about. So. Um, I appreciate it. I, and I appreciate the opportunity as always. So, well, Tom, of course, and for any listeners that are, that are interested, your articles and, and more of you is available at tomluongo.me at TFL1728 on Twitter and the Gold Goats and Guns podcast, which I recommend everybody listen to because and, it's, the, uh, uh, and the Patreon. I just, you know, and if yep. you want to support the work directly, um, monetarily, where a lot of the, the, a lot of the stuff is actually now behind the paywall simply because I, I have a, a big enough Patreon community now that I have to service them first. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we've hit escape velocity in that respect. And we're very happy about that. And I have, I have one of the best communities in the world. I mean, I, I just, I, I love my community. They're, they're so good. They teach me stuff every day because they're all experts in things that I'm not an expert in. Mm -hmm. And that just makes just, just a good thing. So, well, right? yeah, it must be just as, just as valuable to you to have people that challenge you and bring you good ideas instead of just reinforcing what, what you're thinking. I couldn't do what I do at this level today, Tom, without the community bringing information to me. I don't mm -hmm. know where to go to get the information. I don't, I would never be able to produce half of what I produce today mm -hmm. because I would be spending all of my time chasing stuff down. And then my confirmation bias would lead me naturally would lead me into possibly into the wrong places. And it would take longer and make it harder to do what needs to be done. It's why, you know, it's why it's, it, it, you know, it's, it, you look at the best people in this business, you know, and you realize that they all have staff or they all have a community around them and they do it because that's the only way they're going to learn because we as a community, you know, 
Klaus Schwab might think he's the smartest guy in the room, but he's not smarter than the room. We're the room. There's yeah, a lot of little subrooms, and then the heads of, and then you know the leaders of the room get to talk talk to each other on 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 a podcast. But ultimately, you know, there's a lot of rooms out there, and those rooms are powerful. Yeah. So yeah, as as you've said before, that change doesn't come from the top down; it has to come from the bottom up. Got it, got it. And that's and that's why I'm you know for anybody who questions my decentralization or libertarian bona fides, no, that has never changed. Mm-hmm. All I'm doing now is assessing the the state of the board based on the rules of the board when the rules of the board change i will change you know i will then try and you know but i'm always going to analyze the board from that perspective mm-hmm. right you know from that foundation someone asked i had a patron ask me this morning you know about this and i said you know is it you know what do you where you know about basically you know should i is it still worth reading man economy and state Murray Rothbard. I'm like, of course it is. You need to have the strong foundation. Even if you even if you don't think Rothbard's right about everything, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You still need to have the strong foundation. You know, you still should read human action. You should still read, you should read Samuelson for Christ's sake. You should read all these terrible people. You know, you should read Marx, you should read Keynes, you should read all these people. Then mm-hmm. figure out and then steal and they, because all they'll do is steal man your own arguments. So yeah, you need to different. you need to understand the other side to be able to to form your opinions. And as well, you know, I think it's as I've said before on on the podcast, understanding where the incentives come from and maybe the psychology behind somebody's ideas is much more valuable than just trying to trying to take the let's say headline view of what they're what they're saying now if you understand where they're coming from that's i think way more valuable well that's the essence of communication right like that's what we're doing the headlines we live in a world and this is the other other problem since it's the information age right but we live in a world of low quality information we live in a world of over information age what's that the the over information Yeah. yeah well that too yeah it's anti-information. It's it's mal. You're you're. We're all maleducated, and we're all being, you know, forced into into ideological, and uh, intellectual rabbit holes that aren't real. And this is very this is very very strong. And I can tell you that Dexter White and I, my my partner in this, have an entire series of podcasts and I- I- issues of the newsletter. And the what our focus is is to talk about this ir- is this this you know the serving the wrong world serving the wrong reality and waking up from the wrong, the, the, the wrong reality. We're going to get all philosophical and, you know, I, I can just, I can see it coming because we, he and I have been talking about it for, for weeks behind the scenes now. And, you know, once we're, once our schedules are such that we can actually start doing a, a series of podcasts again, I can tell you, this is where we're going mm-hmm. and it will, it will veer far away from just capital markets. Capital markets would be the metaphor for the prop for what the real problem is, mm-hmm. which is the maleducation and, the uh, and the serving of masters, the ser- intellectually and emotionally, and that's a very that's a very powerful thing. And I think once we get there, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. So, mm-hmm. and it should help to frame, you know, the way we look at our own lives and the way we look at and the way we interact with um, all of this stuff. We want to stay out of fight or flight. We want to stay out of um, panic. And the goal of all the malinformation is to constantly keep you panicking. That's why I looked at the situation over the weekend. I said, yeah, someone's really putting their thumb on the scale of the doom porn to try and create something that's not real. This is not a systemic risk, this bank. Silicon Valley. This is about something. This is someone's ox is being bored. And, they're, and, and naturally speaking, oh, look, the Fed just took a rook. You don't think that Davos is not going to try and move their bishop in position to put pressure on the queen? Mm-hmm. Really? Of course they are. So, Again, I, mean, got, the- I mean, they still have power. They're still going to, they saw pieces on the board. They're going to use it. Mm-hmm. So, that's what I got. Sounds good, Tom. Well, again, appreciate your time and sharing all your ideas with us. Really, really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you for the opportunity as always. And you, you be well. You too. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. 
Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.